Welcome to the Coin Bureau Weekly News Roundup. Here are the top stories in crypto this week. Crypto market crash. Coins and tokens tumble after US regulators begin cracking down on some of the biggest companies, exchanges and projects in the industry. How will this affect crypto? Stablecoins under scrutiny. BUSD and PAXG issuer Paxos gets probed by US authorities while Tether's US-based reserves come under scrutiny. Which stablecoin is the safest to hold right now? CBDC rollout accelerates. The Bank for Central Banks expands its CBDC research as Russia, India and the United Kingdom move closer to dystopian digital currencies. When will the first CBDCs be released? Local Bitcoins shuts down. The once popular peer-to-peer -peer crypto trading platform closes its doors after 10 years. Why did this happen and what does it mean for peer-to-peer -peer transactions? Higher for longer. Investors start to price in the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates higher for longer than initially expected as publicly traded companies continue their layoffs. Everything you need to know. And the thoughts of Benjamin Cowan to take us into another week. All this and more in just a moment. Good morning, afternoon or evening. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Guy. This is educational content, not financial advice. And here are this week's top stories. Last week, the crypto market crashed in response to a series of headlines about a whole slew of crackdowns. The most significant of these is the sudden crackdown on cryptocurrency staking by the SEC, specifically a crackdown on staking services offered by cryptocurrency exchanges. On the 8th of February, Bloomberg reported that the SEC was investigating Kraken over unregistered sales of securities. Now, for context, a security is any asset where the expectation of profit is coming from an identifiable third party. The SEC believes most cryptocurrencies are securities, including stablecoins. The SEC also believes that staking services offered by cryptocurrency exchanges count as unregistered securities offerings, and this is why the regulator went after Kraken. Kraken ended up settling with the SEC for $30 million, and as part of the settlement, Kraken stopped offering staking to retail users in the US. All eyes are now on Coinbase, which subsequently put out a statement arguing that the staking services it offers are not an unregistered securities offering. The SEC clearly thinks otherwise, but the difference is that Coinbase has a lot more capital than Kraken and can take the SEC to court. Now, this is a problem because if the SEC does engage Coinbase over its staking services, it could have a negative impact on proof-of-stake cryptocurrencies that Coinbase offers staking services for. This is because Coinbase would likely be required to pause its staking services until the case is resolved. It's also a much bigger problem than meets the eye because exchanges like Coinbase and Kraken are the largest validators on most proof-of-stake blockchains, including Ethereum. Not only that, but a significant amount of Coinbase and Kraken's income comes from staking services. The silver lining to this crackdown on centralized staking services is that it's effectively forcing US users of these exchanges to use decentralized staking services instead. Liquid staking protocols like Lido Finance and Rocket Pool have seen massive inflows and their tokens have pumped in response. More about Lido Finance in the description. Now, the problem there is that the SEC isn't a big believer in DeFi. SEC Chairman Gary Gensler has said these kinds of DeFi protocols are, quote, highly centralized and should therefore register with the SEC just like centralized exchanges. As such, we could see the SEC go after these liquid staking protocols too. If that wasn't bad enough, Gary also believes that the proof-of-stake cryptocurrencies themselves are securities, and he said this on the same day of Ethereum's transition from proof-of-work to proof-of-stake. This means that even staking directly to the blockchain could also be forbidden by the SEC. Now, as much as I want to promise that the SEC won't go as far as cracking down on proof-of-stake cryptocurrencies, the harsh reality is that it can't be ruled out just yet. 
And before you convert all your proof-of-stake cryptos to stablecoins, you should know that this is not a safe option anymore either. This is because stablecoin issuers are starting to face extreme regulatory scrutiny too, and the first on the chopping block is Paxos. For those unfamiliar, Paxos is the issuer of Binance's BUSD stablecoin. It's also the issuer of another USD stablecoin called USDP, as well as a gold-backed stablecoin, PAXG. Now, following reports that the New York Department of Financial Services was probing Paxos for unspecified reasons, on Sunday evening, it was announced that who else but the SEC is planning to sue Paxos for selling BUSD as an unregistered security. The SEC has issued a Wells notice to Paxos, which is basically a letter informing the recipient that the agency is planning to take legal action against them. Paxos now has 30 days in which to write back and explain to the SEC why legal action is not necessary. To be clear, a Wells notice isn't a legal action per se, but it's certainly a clear shot across the bows. There'll be some overtime being pulled at Paxos HQ in the coming days, that is for sure. The SEC takes action in around 80% of cases where a Wells notice is issued, by the way. Now, whatever the outcome of this Wells notice, it's already significant enough that PayPal has decided to pause work on its stablecoin project, which was being developed in partnership with Paxos. This begs the chilling question of what would happen if US regulators forced Paxos to do something drastic like drop BUSD. Well, the good news is that a ban on BUSD would have a limited impact on the crypto ecosystem because BUSD is used primarily on Binance and the BNB chain. The bad news is that a crackdown on BUSD could result in a crypto bank run on Binance and do serious damage to the BNB chain ecosystem. To be clear, I'm confident that Binance would be fine in such a scenario. This is because it has sufficient crypto reserves to honor all customer withdrawals and survived a multi-billion dollar bank run just a couple of months ago. The point is that the crypto market would survive a BUSD crackdown, assuming it comes at all. There would of course be no shortage of volatility, but it would pale in comparison to the kind of volatility we'll see if US regulators decide to do the unthinkable and crack down on Tether. Although Tether itself is located outside of the United States, the reserves backing its USDT stablecoin are apparently not. According to the Wall Street Journal, American financial services firm Cantor Fitzgerald is helping manage $39 billion in US government debt that backs USDT. This headline might sound benign, but it's eerily similar to the one from Bloomberg about BUSD reserves in early January this year. I have a feeling this headline sent a signal to US regulators to start investigating Paxos. If I'm correct, we could see the same thing happen to Cantor Fitzgerald. Now, as much as I want to say that this is purely speculation, the fact of the matter is that it's the beginning of a coordinated operation to cut crypto companies off from the US financial system. The crypto community is calling this Operation Choke Point 2.0, and I'll be doing a video about it later this week. Now, regarding which stablecoin is the safest to hold, the answer is none of them. While Circles USDC has been recently seen as the safest stablecoin, it may not be immune to Choke Point 2.0. Then again, Circles' partnership with BlackRock could protect it from any unwarranted scrutiny. More about that using the link in the description. Speaking of Circle, some of you may know that the World Economic Forum and others have been actively discussing the idea of a so-called synthetic central bank digital currency, or CBDC, wherein a stablecoin like USDC would be backed by reserves held at a central bank. It looked like this was the direction central banks were headed, but the scrutiny of stablecoin issuers we've seen over the last few months seems to have turned them back to the idea of a standard CBDC. This is evidenced by the Bank for International Settlements, or BIS's, sudden expansion in CBDC research. If you've watched any of our videos about the BIS, you'll know that it's the self-described bank for central banks, and it's been helping central banks around the world roll out their CBDCs. You'll also know that CBDCs will make it possible for governments to control your money to a dystopian degree. 
The BIS has long been skeptical of stablecoins, and this is simply because central banks consider stablecoins to be their biggest competitors in the digital currency space. Lo and behold, the BIS's new expansion into CBDCs will be accompanied by the development of a stablecoin monitoring platform. Meanwhile, one of Russia's largest banks is asking Russia's central bank to take it slow with the rollout of its digital ruble. Gazprom Bank is concerned that a CBDC will affect its bottom line. Note that research by the BIS and others has confirmed that commercial banks will have a hard time with CBDCs. It's a similar story in India, whose central bank recently launched its first digital rupee pilot. The Reserve Bank of India has specified that it's in no rush to fully roll out its CBDC, and it's starting with just 50,000 users and 5,000 merchants. If China's CBDC pilots are anything to go by, India's won't be successful. That's why it still blows my mind that the UK is continuing down the CBDC path. Last week, the UK Treasury and Bank of England released a consultation paper about a digital pound. It specifies that the digital pound will initially have a limit of 10,000 to 20,000 per individual. If you watched our recent video about the EU's upcoming digital euro, you'll know that these limits on holdings are intended to discourage hoarding of CBDCs during times of crisis. Naturally, the goal is to force the adoption of a CBDC using a crisis, but alternative forms of currency need to be killed off first. Logically, this means we're unlikely to see mass CBDC adoption anytime soon. Besides killing off alternative currencies, governments around the world need to roll out digital IDs before they roll out their CBDCs. After all, they need to know whose bank accounts to empty and whose to fill up. Unfortunately for the people in power, the average person will always find a way to transact using an alternative currency. Fortunately for the people paying attention, there's no shortage of alternatives available. The only issue is the secure exchange of these alternative currencies, particularly digital ones. When it comes to cryptocurrency, local bitcoins was one of the first to facilitate the exchange of coins and tokens between people. As the name suggests, local bitcoins was built to make it easy and safe to buy and sell cryptocurrency with other people in your area and eventually internationally. As is often the case in cryptocurrency, local bitcoins started to lose market dominance when centralized cryptocurrency exchanges like Binance started to become popular. Soon, local bitcoin's only advantage was the privacy it offered. This caused its customer base to skew to, shall we say, people engaged in questionable activity. Not surprisingly, this resulted in lots of regulatory scrutiny, which is why local bitcoin started implementing KYC on larger peer-to-peer -peer trades sometime in 2019. It also announced that it would be requiring KYC from all users to comply with Europe's anti-money laundering regulations. Obviously, the KYC implementation alienated local Bitcoins' privacy-oriented customer base. It also made the platform more regulated than centralized exchanges, except worse. The worst part was that most offshore cryptocurrency exchanges were still not requiring KYC at this time. To add insult to injury, local Bitcoins' compliance didn't seem to increase its appeal in the eyes of regulators. This resulted in local Bitcoins partnering with blockchain analytics firm Elliptic in 2020 to track every peer-to-peer -peer trade on its platform, eliminating the little privacy that was left. Now, despite these unprecedented restrictions, local Bitcoins didn't die. This is probably because of the crypto bull run, which began in late 2020. The bull market must have been very good for local bitcoins because it managed to release a new mobile app for its 1.7 million users in October 2021. But alas, bull markets do not last forever. Crypto prices started to crash in November 2021, and this accelerated in the spring of 2022. The tragic cherry on top was Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Local bitcoins was very popular in Russia, but in October 2022, sanctions forced it to exit the country. The final nail in the coffin for local bitcoins was the revelation that the platform had sent and received transactions from criminal Russian crypto exchange Bitslato prior to exiting Russia. 
Local Bitcoins died last week after 10 and a half years of life, and users now have 12 months to withdraw their crypto. Now, as sad as this news is, I am optimistic about the future of peer to peer platforms like Local Bitcoins. Many peer to peer platforms still exist, and some of them still protect your privacy. These platforms will only become more popular as crypto adoption grows, along with the demand for privacy. The real tragedy is that the statistics from anti money laundering organizations like the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, suggest that privacy killing regulations like KYC have no measurable impact on illicit financial activity. I reckon this is because human corruption can't be regulated. You can learn more about that using the link in the description. Now, before I hand Ben the mic, I want to talk about what the Fed has been up to, especially because the CPI for January will be released tomorrow morning. In case you missed the memo, the reason why the markets rallied so much in January was in part because investors thought inflation was coming down. The reason why the market started to crash late last week was, in part, because of revisions to the CPI that were made by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The TLDR is that the CPI prints for November and December were higher than initially reported. This means the January CPI may come in hotter than expected. There are fundamental reasons for this too. Petrol prices in the United States rose in January. The price of oil has been rising as well, in part because Russia announced that it will be cutting its oil production in March in response to sanctions. This will lead to more energy driven inflation. If you watched our video about BlackRock's 2023 predictions, you'll know that the infamous asset manager planned, I mean predicted, that inflation is going to stay high for a long time. BlackRock recently put its money where its mouth is by betting that the Fed will keep interest rates higher for longer. By now, most of you will know that the reason why the Fed will keep interest rates higher for longer is because it's trying to crush inflation. If BlackRock is right about inflation not coming down, then it means interest rates will stay up. This will cause more money to flow out of the markets, including crypto. It also means that the real economy is likely to take a real beating. So far, most of the layoffs we've seen have been from companies in the tech and financial sectors. However, it's only a matter of time before the heat of higher interest rates starts to affect companies in other economic sectors. At the same time, the average person is being squeezed by a combination of higher inflation and higher interest rates. It seems that the only thing keeping mass insolvencies at bay is all the pandemic stimulus that's still working its way around the economy, and the fact that most debt deals are long dated. The caveat is that these pandemic cash cushions are held mostly by wealthy individuals and institutions. The average person is suffering more with each passing day, and it's only a matter of time before they say enough is enough. It's possible that CBDC based stimulus will be used to keep them from rioting. Considering how brutal the last three years have been, though, it wouldn't surprise me if the people in power go straight to third base by orchestrating mass bank bail ins. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you must watch yesterday's video on that very subject. That will be in the description. But before you head down there, it's time for Ben Cowan's amazing crypto analysis. So take it away, Ben. Hey, Guy. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here as always. Because there's a lot of talk recently about golden crosses and death crosses, I thought I would at least spend a little bit of time talking about that. We did have a golden cross on the daily time frame not too long ago, marking really the first golden cross we've had since the bear market began back in November of 2021. And one of the interesting things about it is sort of look at what it has historically meant. And one thing to note is that both in the recovery year following the 2018 bear market and the recovery year following the 2014 bear market, we actually had multiple of these golden crosses before we actually had a sustained bull market to new highs. Speculating, you can see that in the first cycle, the yellow dashed line here is what's showing you when we had the golden cross, the cross of the 50-day SMA above the 200-day SMA. We had one golden cross before a bull run to new highs. In the second cycle during that recovery year, we actually had two golden crosses, right? Two golden crosses before the bull run to new all-time highs. 
And in the third cycle, so the third recovery year, you catch, so we had three golden crosses before we actually had a move to new all-time highs. So yes, it's always nice to see a golden cross, and it's certainly at least a progression from, from sort of the down only year that we had in 2022. But just to keep our expectations in check, history generally does show us that we will likely see multiple of these golden crosses and death crosses on the daily time frame, you know, probably for the next 12 to 18 months or so before we actually get into a rally that is 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 likely to take us to new all-time highs. So just something to consider. And then of course there's the the elephant in the room is is we've had a weekly death cross for the first time. So this is the first time the 50-week SMA has crossed below the 200-week SMA. And frankly, we, no one really knows exactly what it means because, well, it's never really happened before. So we can speculate, of course. Uh, if you take a look at the S&P 500, it's usually not the best sign in the world, but for every, you know, for every couple of times, you'll find that you can find an instance where it, it didn't mean a thing and, 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 and the price continued higher. But I think a lot of people should be generally aware, though, my general thinking on, on golden crosses and death crosses are they, they very much are lagging indicators. And they sort of already tell you what you already know, right? Like you don't need a, a golden cross like we just had to tell you that the price has been going up recently, right? We know that it's been rallying off 15.5 all the way up to almost, you know, over $24,000. And a lot of times after a golden cross, you'll actually see a, a short-term pullback, right? You see that right here, right? We had a golden cross and then just after it, we had about an 8% pullback. This is actually pretty standard you'll often find pullbacks after a golden cross on the daily time frame. And, and it's one of those things that I, I think, you know, you hear the word golden cross and you assume that, all right, well, that means price has to immediately head higher. Normally it's the reverse, right? A lot of times golden crosses, you'll see short-term pullbacks and death crosses, you can see short-term moves to the upside. So just something to consider as you navigate the sort of the terminology of golden crosses and death crosses. And the other thing I wanted to mention is, is sort of thinking about the, the ROI after the peak or say the drawdown as a function of time as measured for say a few different assets and sort of seeing a lot of people talk about comparing Bitcoin and Ethereum and how Bitcoin put in a new low in November, whereas Ethereum did not. But if we're, if we're keeping ourselves honest and we're just measuring it from their respective highs, and not cherry picking, you know, say one low for one and another low for another. While Ethereum has not yet, at least, put in a, a new low, you'll see that the pull down, the drawdown from the all time high for both Bitcoin and Ethereum is actually about the same right now. And in fact, Bitcoin is a little bit better than Ethereum, despite the fact that Ethereum has not put in a new June low. One of the reasons for that is because during the capitulation back in April, May, and June of 2022, Ethereum went a lot lower than Bitcoin. And so, yes, it had a nice recovery, but they've more or less just been um, sort of just in lockstep ever since. And then the one, you know, to, to compare it to an altcoin, right, just to compare it to ADA, this is a coin that I've spoken about before. I know you've spoken about it as well. And sort of trying to think is, you know, are there any blue chips besides Bitcoin and Ethereum? It's, you know, when you look at an altcoin and a lot of the altcoins, and you just sort of see this slow bleed where they're well, where the ROI is measured from the peak where in the bear market, sort of the drawdown from the all-time high, when it's just a slow bleed well below what would be considered the two, the, blue, the two blue chips, it really does show you why, you know, blue chips in general, um, you know, provide, at least historically, provide provide um, some protection from from the from the uh, potential drawdown than, than a lot of the altcoin market. There's always a few altcoins that, that will outperform. I'm not trying to take away from that, but it does just show you just how much more brutal the altcoin market can be. For instance, the ROI from peak for Bitcoin right now is 0.323. For Ethereum, it's 0.317, but for ADA, it's 0.122. Now that makes a big difference when you actually, you know, calculate out what that would mean for a portfolio. So just something to consider. And I, I think it's worthwhile to consider this as well for you know future future bear markets, right? We always know that altcoins can give outsized gains in bull markets. They can also drop a lot in bear markets, and that's why you know having you know protecting yourself in some sense is is often um, not always a bad way to go. Thanks again for having me, guy. Pleasure to be here as always. I'll see you again next week. Bye. Thank you, Ben. And Ben will be hosting our weekly live stream this week on his channel, Into the Cryptoverse. 
Please do join him, yours truly, and Rob from Digital Asset News on Thursday at 9am Eastern Time. And that is all for today's Coin Bureau Weekly Crypto Review. If you enjoyed it, you know what to do. Hit that like button, subscribe button, and bell icon too. If you're looking to maximize your gains during the bear market, the Coin Bureau Deals page is where you should go. You can find the link to that resource and many others in the description below. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you in next week's episode. Thank <laughs> you.